year and a half, all I've heard is Mandy, Mandy, Mandy. Mandy, Mandy, Mandy. Those that have known you all your life and, and your mother and dad, I have never, I, I thought I bragged on my daughter, but I can't hold a candle to what has gone on for me since you have left. And I want you to know it's all the absolute truth, every bit of it. I'm glad you're here. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. I want you to turn to uh, Romans 5, verse 10 and 11. Romans 5, verse 10 and 11. Romans 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exult or celebrate in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Uh, King James says atonement, atonement. Reconciliation is from God to us, humankind, through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. It also means to restore, to settle, to resolve. The King James uses atonement, which means satisfaction. God has made atonement or satisfaction for our sins. It doesn't take long for anyone here in this room, any one of us, to see why reconciliation is so needed today for us to be reconciled back to God. All we have to do is take a look around, watch the daily news as long as we can stand it. Sin is running rampant in this world. Many are calling evil good and good evil. Homosexuality, transgender, foul language, murder, no value of human life, no compassion. All anger you see from people shooting at cars to each other down the interstate. All the way to Walmart for free shopping sprees, which are thieves who are doing that. Reconciliation has been necessary since the Garden of Eden. God created the universe and the earth to perfection. And He created man and woman and He put us in that perfect location. Perfect garden. And He gave them only one command. <laughs> only one command. You will not eat of the tree in the middle of the garden or you will die, Genesis 2 and verse 16. And we all know that it was more than they could stand. Sin and death entered the world and we became separated from God. And He can reconcile us back. Without God's grace, His plan of reconciliation would have no hope in this world for you and I. And we would face the wrath of God and sin would destroy, has destroyed our relationship with God because of that. In Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot say, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities or wrongdoings have caused a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. Our perfect God hates sin. He hates sin. Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19. You'll find out some things. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that revives... Uh, devises wicked pl plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, false witness who declares lies and who spreads strife among his brothers. All of that's going on today, isn't it? 
Thankfully, God has a plan to reconcile us to Him. Back to Him. To atone for our sins against God. It was the highest price that God could pay to reconcile us. To redeem us from sin. It was a price of blood. The price of the sacrifice of His Son on the cross. And He would die in our place for the sins of the world. God prepared man by the use of sacrificial offerings and, and, and worship in the old law years before Jesus came to this earth. Jewish people that we talked about in class this morning, Jewish people, their holiest day was the Day of Atonement. It was the day when the high priest went in and made sacrifice in the temple in the Holy of Holies for the nation and for himself and all the sins of the nation and all the sins of himself so that they would be remembered no more every year. <laughs> every year he had to do it. Every year, so he had to go in and do the very same thing to remember those sins. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> and stay, stay there for a minute because we'll look at Hebrews 9 here in just a second. Hebrews 9, beginning at verse 11, we're going to look at. All the sacrifices made in the blood of animals that were under the Old Testament system foreshadowed the ultimate sacrifice until the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and the full price that was paid. And so in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 11, but when Christ appeared as the high priest of good things. Let's go to, yeah, I'm right, verse 11. Having come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made by hands, that is, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through His own blood. He entered the holy place for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifers, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. What I intended to do was Hebrews chapter 10 first, and I may have said that, so I want you to look at that first. Again, pretend we hadn't looked at Hebrews 9 first. <laughs> I'm kidding with you. Hebrews 10, began verse 1. For the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the form of those things itself, can never by same sacrifices which they offer continually, how often? Every year. Make those who approach perfect. Otherwise they would not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers having, been once, having once been cleansed would no longer have had their conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see, we have an eternal Savior that gave His blood. What a price God paid to shed His Son's blood on the cross for our sins. He was perfect. He had no sin. God's plan for our reconciliation <clears throat> is for every person who wants to escape God's wrath. I hope you raised your hand. I do. Escape God's wrath. <clears throat> because our sins in a sinful world, we must respond to the gospel of Christ to have forgiveness of our sins by Jesus' blood. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he or the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Each person, every one of us, 
is responsible as an individual to obey the gospel to be saved. Those who reject him will face the judgment. Jesus told Nicodemus what he needed to do in John 3 and verse 3. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus also tells us that few will be saved. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. There are many who enter through it. The gate is small. And the way is narrow. That leads to life. And there are few who find it. And that run chills up you. There are few who find it. <clears throat> so what does the Lord require? We've already looked at some things. What does the Lord require? Micah 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. And to give relief who are afflicted along with us when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels take in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey the gospel of Christ, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's pretty clear. I think every one of us understand those words. The good news of the gospel tells of Jesus' life and death and burial and resurrection and how to become a Christian. That's the gospel. And in Acts chapter 8, Philip spoke to the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian's in a chariot. And he had been to Jerusalem to worship. So he's reading Isaiah, the suffering of Jesus. And Philip caught up with him, got in the chariot, explained Isaiah 53 to him, and from that point right there, he preached the gospel to him. The Ethiopian had been to Jerusalem to worship. Hey, listen, man, this, this man was a believer. He worshiped God. And he said to Philip, Look, water, what hinders me to be baptized? And Philip says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he stopped the chariot. And he said... The Ethiopian, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went down and Philip baptized him. He obeyed the gospel of Christ. But you know something? That's just the beginning of our faith. John 8 and verse 24 said, Jesus says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. And then we repent of our sins and we change our way of life. In Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And then the Lord requires baptism for the forgiveness of of our sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. Why does he do that? Look at Romans chapter 6. We'll see why he does require that. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly He shall also be, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer 
be slaves to sin. I think that's pretty clear to us, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. You shouldn't have any problem. And the world has got a lot of problems. They've been deceived. Once a person does what the Lord requires, you've been reconciled back to God. You have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. All of God's promises are yours and, and you begin to grow as a Christian. We must grow as a Christian. We're, fruit, but we're to be fruit-bearing Christians. 2 Peter chapter 1, 4-8. through 8. I want you to follow along with me there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4-8. through 8. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. For by these, all the promises of God, for by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may, what? Become partakers of His divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, he tells us what to do. Applying all diligence to your faith. Supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are what? Increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that. Apply diligence in our life as a Christian. Supply moral excellence. Knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. We're to have these things as a Christian. We're to grow. A faithful Christian, future sins are forgiven. God covers these sins by Jesus' blood. Jesus paid the price to redeem us, to reconcile you and I back to God. Romans 8 and verse 1 Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You say to yourself, wait a minute. Yeah, that's the price he paid on that cross. But Galatians 3 and verse 27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves or put on Christ. 1 John 1 and verse 7 but we to walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His Son cleanses us from all sin. It doesn't give us the license to go out and live how we want to because we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. It doesn't give us the right to go out and sin and do whatever we want to do and turn our back on Him and live how we want. The point is, He covers us with His blood. But we have to always serve Him. We have to walk in the light. If we turn our back on Him and we are not faithful, there are many who can and many who do fall away from the grace of God. If we do not repent and if we do not come back to Him, we die in our sins. And our name is going to be blotted out of the book of life. I do not want my name blotted out of the book of life. Do you? But the benefit for a faithful Christian is he allows for continual fellowship with God, with Christ, with all the brothers and sisters in Christ that we are together. 1 John 1 and verse 3 says, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. God promises to assure us of our heavenly future. James 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials. We have those, don't we? Each day we have trials and problems that come along in our life. 
And James in verse 1 and verse 12 said, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive what you and I want, the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. As a child of God's promises, we have the fulfillment through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. He conquered death, and because He lives, now listen, He conquered death, and because He lives, you and I will live again after this life. We sing a song over that because he lives. Not only do we have salvation and fellowship with God because we have been reconciled, we also have joy, we also have hope, we also have peace, and we will not have to face the wrath of God and I don't want to do that. And I know you don't. Heaven is our home. That's what we want. That's why we are being faithful to God. That's why we are dedicated and committed to Him. By being reconciled back to God, we have peace with God. Abiding in Christ Jesus. And He now lives in you and I. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So we have to ask ourselves, are we walking in Him? Are we walking in the world? Have we clothed ourselves in Him? Do we belong to Him? The only way we can be clothed in Him is to be baptized in Him for the remission of our sins. We are Christians, united, and we abide in Him. I, I, I want you to look, look and, and, and if you don't have your Bibles, listen to Jesus' prayer in the garden just before the cross John chapter 17 beginning at verse 20 <clears throat> I want you to listen to Jesus' prayer right before the cross John chapter 17 verse 20 and 21 he says I do not ask on behalf of these alone these alone are his disciples now watch but for those also who believe in me through their word. Who is that? That's you and I. That's us. He is praying for us because he knows where to come. He's praying for us that we will believe in me, believe in him through their word, that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Now watch. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's why we are free to be fruit-bearing Christians. We're now to abide together in unity as this congregation. We have to be in unity. Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 6 Therefore, he said, Therefore I, which is Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called. Now look, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and a bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of His calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. It's a walk of faith by us. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. And you know, when we become a Christian, we want to work, don't we? Because we love Him. We want to work. We want to work. 
Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. We're ready for every good work. <clears throat> Before I close, I, I want to go back again for a second. Remember the old law on the Day of Atonement? And the high priest entered the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice for the nation and for his own sins. And he did that once a year. Once a year. Can you imagine how many years? Can you imagine how much blood from all those animals through the years? Even the Passover and all those? Can you imagine? And now Jesus is our high priest. And he made a one-time perfect sacrifice by perfect Lamb of God to sacrifice for you and I's sins. He did this for us. And when he died, the curtain in the Holy of Holies tore in half. It tore apart. You know why? Because it's never going to be needed again. Because <laughs> he is our high priest. In a temple not made with hands. Hebrews 9, verse 11 and 14. I want to read that again before we quit. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things, having come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation. And though not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. We have been redeemed. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify the cleansing of the flesh. Verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Salvation is a gift of God. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. There's nothing we could do except obey Him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may bo boast. You know, you think about that, and, and water that we have today that we turn on the tap and fill our glass, it quenches the thirst. We go to the doctor and the doctor gives us medicine that makes us well. But there's something far greater than all of that. The blood of Jesus Christ. It's contacted. We contact that blood in our baptism. We're born again, a new person. We're buried with Him. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. For the remission or forgiveness of our sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. He says that baptism now saves us. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 21. It is to cleanse us of our sins. Hebrews 9 verse 14. We have redemption. We have been redeemed. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. If you're not a Christian, like Jesus says, not some other fella, like Jesus says, to believe in Him and to repent of our sins and to confess that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to be baptized for the remission of our sins or forgiveness of our sins. If you have not done this, then you have the opportunity to do that now. Please do, don't wait. You may never get another chance if you are a Christian. Are you faithful in your life? Are you walking that narrow way? If not, 
You need to make it right. You need to repent. And you need to make it right with God. Won't you come while we stand and sing?